Here's our last little bit on our uh, little introduction to particle physics. Uh, this is exchange particles. So we need to talk a little bit about how forces are caused and we need to know about how we can show these interactions. Okay, You've all come across the term field in physics, magnetic fields, gravitational fields, and you kind of accept those, don't you? Because we grow up kind of in a gravitational field. Nobody can deny the existence of gravity. Um, but it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because how exactly does that happen? How does the Earth pull the Moon through the vacuum of space in between? We kind of accept this idea of field because we're brought up with it. Um, well, we haven't really got a good model for that, have we? Okay, there are interesting ideas about how gravity actually works and whether gravity even really exists or not. Okay, but if we say how do two electrons repel each other, Okay, then rather than having a field model, there is another sort of model that we use, a particle model for how these interactions can actually take place. Okay, and this model says that all forces are, are carried or mediated by particles called exchange particles or sometimes vector bosons. Okay, a vector, remember, is just to do with direction. A boson is a different kind of particle to the ones we've talked about before, uh, which are sometimes called fermions. So there are different particles for the different forces, and you need to be able to match the particles to the different forces. Um, so because these matter particles are constantly exchanging the particles with each other, okay, what we come to is this idea that they can just produce a particle, it gets absorbed by the other thing, and then it just appears. There's a rule which we don't have to know about, fortunately, called the uncertainty principle. But what that says is that you can make a certain amount of mass energy. You can break the conservation of mass energy for a very short amount of time. Okay, this time is given by this little equation. Delta E delta T is less than the Planck constant, so you'll be able to work out there that if you wanted to borrow the energy for a second, then the energy you could borrow would be only this number of joules, which is not very much even on the scale of uh, subatomic things. But if you only wanted to borrow the energy for a very short amount of time, you might be able to borrow quite a bit more energy. Um, so this is the law that makes these things possible, okay, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You don't need to know about this, but there are proper explanations for why some things which seem a little bit crazy are possible. Okay, so here's the things we need to know. Here's our forces. We've talked about gravity. Uh, we've got the electromagnetic force, so everything you've got to do with static electricity and magnetism, that's all covered by the electromagnetic force. Then we've got the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force, okay? So we've mentioned all these forces at some point. Um, the exchange particle for gravity has not been proven, so it's called a graviton, but we don't really know if these particles exist. There's a lot of work going on to understand gravitational waves through space and stuff. But its range, as far as we know, is infinite, so it stretches all the way across the universe. The electromagnetic force is the virtual photon. Um, I've put photon there, okay, but they sometimes like the word virtual in there because we can't detect it because if we detect it, it's not actually an exchange particle. It kind of gone from the one object to the other object. Um, the range of the electromagnetic force is also infinite. The weak nuclear force is carried by these particles that we haven't talked about yet, the W plus, W minus, and Z zero particles. You know that these got have got a very short range, 10 to the minus 18 meters, so this is only inside hadrons. And then the strong nuclear force is carried by the pion, if it's in between nucleons, or the gluon inside nucleons. And the range, well, we talked in quite a lot of detail, didn't we, about the range of the strong nuclear force, okay, being around up to about 3 femtometers, 3 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay, so you need to learn that table, um, particularly the W particles and Z particles and the pion as the exchange particle for the strong nuclear force and the virtual photon for the electromagnetic force. Okay, so the second part of this is how we can put all this into diagrams. Well, here's our field model that we've got. If I said to you, I've got two electrons, they're moving towards each other, what do you think will happen? These electrons are moving um, together in this direction, but so that we can draw it into a diagram, we don't really want just one dimension here, so we're going to make them go up the page. Okay, so here they go, they push apart, they repel, don't they? We already knew that, okay? But the question we're doing on this is, well, how do they repel? So here's our particle model of this. Well, we know the exchange particle is a virtual photon, which we usually just um, depict with a, a gamma. So here they come, 
the one on the left throws a gamma particle to one on the right because it's thrown a particle out that's made it go backwards. The other one's caught a particle that's made it go that way. So this is our particle model, okay? So two interactions with two different ways of thinking about them. We're doing particle physics, so we're looking at this particle model of how these things work. This is how we write that as a diagram. So here's our two electrons. Right, This electron has thrown out a, a photon, and the other electron has moved backwards. Okay, As I say, let me try and explain this again. This is time on this axis, so really these particles are going just left and right. But if we draw it like that, it's not very clear what's going on. So we have time on the vertical axis and make the particles go this way. These are really important for you. These are called Feynman diagrams after a great guy called Richard Feynman. And he uh, designed these diagrams as a way of kind of representing, visualizing what's going on in some of these particle interactions. Okay, There's a lot of very complicated stuff in there which we don't have to worry about. But we just have to have a rough idea, a quick introduction to some of the basic ideas behind Feynman diagrams. Okay, a couple of points about this. We don't draw these axes, so I've just put the axes on so that you know what's going on here. But they don't normally draw these axes. It's just assume that time is vertical and distance is horizontal. And something you might have noticed, conventional particles um, are drawn with straight lines, but these exchange particles, these vector bosons, are drawn with different kinds of squiggly lines where I'm just going to draw this kind of lines, but there are actually there is a sort of set of codes for which kind of particle it is, which kind of line you draw. Um, so, to draw a particle of two neutrons being held together in the nucleus, okay, we need to go through the same thinking process. So, two neutrons are held together by the strong nuclear force. They must be drifting apart, and the strong nuclear force is going to pull them back together. The exchange particle between baryons is the pion. So, we end up with this diagram. Here's a neutron that's drifting left. Here's a neutron that's drifting right. Okay, they exchange this pion, and that makes them pull back together. It must be a pi zero because the neutron didn't change its charge. We'll talk about this in a minute, but hit the conservation of charge at this point in time here. I've got something neutral. It's still neutral. So the only kind of particle it kind of produced was a neutral particle. You can't break the law of conservation of charge, not even for very short times. Okay. So what you need to know is some specific examples. So we've got here a uh, a proton electron collision so we've got a proton electron they collide they interact with each other and they form a neutron and a neutrino so we've started off with a proton electron okay this is done by the weak nuclear force so the exchange particle is some sort of w particle there will always be w particles in the questions you get in these exams so the proton the electron are coming together crazily this huge great w particle has got enormous mass is produced Right, we can draw all that now, so I can't see that anymore. Let's draw it on a diagram. So here's our proton, it turned into a neutron. Look at the conservation of charge going here. We've got a positive thing turned into a neutral thing. So the other particle that's produced must have been positive. The W plus comes up here. It's absorbed by this negative thing, which turns into something neutral. Okay, so there's the Feynman diagram, which um, represents a proton-electron collision. Okay, here's a weak nuclear force one again. They're all weak nuclear force, these diagrams that you have to draw for the exams. For um, beta decay, so in beta decay, a neutron turns into a proton plus a beta particle plus an antineutrino. Remember, we must have the antineutrino there because that's the conservation of a lepton number that would be broken if all we had was the beta particle. So we start off with a neutron. Okay, that produces this W particle and makes us a proton, an antineutrino, and an electron. If we draw that out, here we go. So we've got a neutron. It's produced this W+. plus. We've got to obey the conservation of baryon number here, so this must still be a baryon. Okay, we've got to obey the conservation of charge. So I've got something neutral, making something positive, so the other thing must be negative. And then it makes these two particles, okay? And a lepton and an antilepton to conserve lepton number. doesn't matter which way around these two go. Okay, here's our third one. So positron decay, very, very similar. We've just got a proton. The proton produces a W particle as well, turns into a neutron. Okay, here's our diagram. The thing people normally find hardest here is just what kind of W particle is it? So we've got something positive turned into something neutral, so the other thing must be have taken the positive charge away. 
Here's our particles. Okay, again, if you're not careful, you might look at that and say, hang on a minute, that's two leptons. I've broken the conservation of lepton number. But remember, this is an anti-lepton, so we're okay. We've got a lepton and an anti-lepton. The lepton number is zero throughout this both sides of this equation. Okay, just one little point on this, and those last couple of examples, the proton and the neutron, is just a change of one quark, isn't it? We've gone from up, up, down, to up, down, down. So sometimes they draw this diagram just the same, but instead of writing a proton turns into a neutron, they just write an up quark turns into a down quark. Okay, these are the examples that you actually have to be able to do. So I suggest that you get a piece of paper and draw those out and then go back and check to see if you've got the right answers.